behalf of the consistory and deacons, we extend a warm welcome to all guests, members, and those who may be live streaming to this worship, worship service. The offertory this afternoon is for award and deed. This afternoon, we welcome Reverend Velinga to the pulpit. May the Lord bless you with wisdom and strength for the task of proclaiming God's holy word to us, that we may be edified through the preaching, that his name may be glorified and praised in our worship as we gather and begin a new week. How pleasant it is that once again we may assemble together as the body of Christ to worship our Lord, to declare again that he is worthy and to rejoice in his blessed promises. The prophet Isaiah of long ago wrote concerning the Lord's grace, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Indeed, congregation, we're gathered in the steadfast love of the Lord, his compassion, and his great goodness, and we praise him for it. Let us rise. It's our holy delight to confess that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Beloved congregation, lift your hearts to heaven and receive the greeting of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit Amen. Let's uh, blend our voices together as one as we uh, turn together singing Psalm 67. Psalm 67.
It's our privilege to bear witness, to bear testimony to the great things of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we take uh, to our hearts and lips the summary of faith by means of the Apostles' Creed, through the use of him too, we sing of what we may believe. That is a blessing that is beyond compare, to believe. It's the richest gift that we may see, receive in our Lord. It's words that are to carry us as we go forth in the journey of life to the life to come. Let us bear testimony of our faith, recognizing that without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Him too, him too. Shall we now join our hearts together as one as we come before the throne of grace in believing prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, whose name is to be hallowed and adored now and forevermore, we come before thee in the name of Christ as the body of Christ. We come as children in dependence upon thee, thy eternal mercies and under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
We've gathered at thy call to exercise our calling to be a worshiping congregation, a congregation of brothers and sisters here in this place. And as we continue in our prayers, we pray be pleased to prosper the gospel ministry here and wherever thy name is proclaimed in spirit and truth. Prosper the gospel ministry in the fruit of repentance and faith. Lord, that our lives would be marked by the mark of Christ as he calls us to follow him. We live in a world that is aimless. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, people walking in darkness. And we rejoice to confess that out of the storehouse of thy amazing grace, thou hast given us thy light. And in thy light we see light. Lord God, we pray that that light would be precious to us. We've been hearing the announcement of an eclipse. And Lord, we, we recognize that what may happen tomorrow is but a small, small picture of the great eclipse to come. When the sun will be darkened and be no more. When the stars will lose their bearings in the heavens above. Where the moon will change its complexion. That great eclipse and the announcement of the last moments of this world. And so, Lord, grant that also in this worship service we may be prepared for what is yet to come. Even as we walk as pilgrims in this world, help us, we pray, in our varied infirmities and strengthen us both in conviction and trust. Embolden us to, to live out of our calling to be ambassadors in thy name. We thank thee for our spiritual blessings. We thank thee, Lord, that in freedom we may be gathered. We thank thee, Lord God, in those blessings we may enjoy the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ, body and soul. We thank thee, Father, that with the hymn writer of long ago, we may confess that at the cross, mercy was great and grace was free, and that the believer goes on to confess, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And so we bear witness, Father, that out of thy loving kindness, out of thy covenantal mercies we have been uprooted from the deepest darkness and have obtained a new life solely by the grace of God to know that Christ died to pay our penalty that he lived for our righteousness by means of his perfect obedience we give praise and adoration for our Savior has burst the bands of death and trampled the powers of darkness down and lives forever. And so we pray as we give heed to the word, as we bear testimony to our confession, as we celebrate and witness the waters of baptism, Help us, we pray, to live in the assurance that, that in Christ we have died, that in Christ we will rise, that in his life we live. In his victory we triumph. And in his ascension we shall be glorified. Father, we pray, lead us, uphold us, Give us hearts that thirst for thy righteousness in Christ. And in his name we pray, amen. Let us continue in the scriptures and at this time turn together to the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. And from... 
the 16th chapter, we're going to read beginning at verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, this is the word, the living word of our living God. <clears throat> when, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord! This shall never happen to you. But he, that is Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. And secondly, let us then continue in the word of God by means of Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, we'll read a short section, 19 through 26. Testimony of the unfolding events in the early church. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch, and when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. First called Christians. And then to Acts 26. Verse 
Acts 26. We want to begin our reading at verse 19. Therefore, this is a, in the context of Paul's defense before Agrippa. He is telling of his conversion. And he goes on to say, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done before in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me for this day might become such as I am except for these chains. Then the king arose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or an imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So far the blessed reading of the Holy Gospels. We thank the Lord that his word is true and sets us free. We reply by singing together from Psalm 89, Psalm 89, 1, 3, and 6.
have been asked to lead you in Lord's Day 12. And so I invite you to turn with me there. Lord's Day 12. It's a Lord's Day that speaks of identity. The identity of who the Lord Jesus is and the identity of who his followers are. We live in a world that is greatly confused by identity to the point that some little boys may not even be sure that they're a boy and some little girls may not be sure that they're a girl. Seeds of confusion sown in our society and how important it is that we together recognize our identity in Christ, little maverick to be baptized. He receives an identity and we rejoice in the identity that we may carry as prophets, priests, and kings. And we trust that as we uh, contemplate together on these great things that the Lord will indeed move our hearts and our souls with praise to him and also move our hearts and souls with the understanding of the testimony that we are to hold high in a world that is dark and that needs the light of the Holy Gospel. Question 31, why he is he, Christ, call, Jesus called Christ, that is anointed? And in an answer, because he has been ordained by God the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher, who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption. Our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us, and who continually intercedes for us before the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, who defends and preserves us in the redemption obtained for us. We might say a, a threefold identity. We might say that in this answer there are, th are three sermons to be delivered. And now, why are you called a Christian? Because I am a member of Christ by faith and thus share in his anointing. So that I may, as prophet, confess his name as a priest, present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and as king, fight with a free and, full, free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. Again, a, a threefold calling, a threefold identity. Again, we could have three sermons on also this particular question, but we keep it to one this afternoon and uh, lift up the great confession that the Lord gives us. <clears throat> Dearly beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when we testify Concerning our Savior, we do so recognizing that our Redeemer, Defender, and Friend is Jesus the Christ. That as the Christ, he has come to us with a particular task, or we might say an undertaking, and that's described for us in summary in question and answer 31. Then those who confess the, the Savior in truth do so recognizing that the followers of Jesus also have been given a particular task, or we might say undertaking, and that in turn is described for us in summary in question and answer 32. In his coming, Jesus received an anointing. Those who believe in true faith also have received an anointing. 
And this is so very important for us to understand and believe if we are to have any sense who Jesus is and what our place in this world is to be. Little Maverick will certainly have to come to know the impact of what 31 and 32 means for him. And it's very precious. The word anoint means to consecrate, to dedicate, to ordain. It's a word that is applied both to Jesus and the followers of Jesus. Our Savior is not simply called Jesus, the one who saves us from the consequences of our sins, but he is called Jesus, the Christ. Christ is not so much a name, but a title, signifying the scope and the breadth of the saving work of our Redeemer, and how it is that, that we in faith are to respond to that saving work. In his baptism, Jesus was anointed and set apart for his public ministry. And when Jesus asked his disciples as he was coming to the close of his ministry as to his identity, as to what people thought who he might be, what they understood concerning their identity, his identity, uh, some would say, well, uh, Jesus was the second coming of John the Baptist, uh, well, a reincarnation of sorts of Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Uh, then Jesus asked more pointedly to the question, all right, these are what others have said, uh, but who do you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up, speaking for the disciples, and he replies, you are are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is called Christ because he was ordained, commissioned, appointed by the Father to a particular task, and that task was sealed with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and our Savior conducted himself precisely according to his mandate, according to the title he had been given, and that he holds the identity wrapped up in the title Christ. Now, how are we to see that identity? The Catechism describes that in a threefold manner. Jesus, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the sacrificial Lamb of God, appointed and anointed by the Holy Spirit in the first place to be our chief prophet and teacher, soak the words in, who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance, that we might be delivered, delivered from bondage, delivered from the tyranny of the devil, delivered from our sin. In his coming, Jesus Christ has been given a prophetic office for our salvation. It is so important that we see our need for a prophet. Treason against God in the fall has darkened mankind's understanding and clouded our judgment. We need a prophet who tells us the truth. We need a prophet who reveals to us the truth that sets us free. Without the light of the gospel, the good news, we would remain in the dark. We who in a society, a crooked and perverse generation, as the Bible describes, have been given the light of the gospel that it might shine in our lives. We notice the darkness that many of our neighbors travel in. They need to hear the gospel now, the gospel writers tell us that people were astonished at uh, Christ's message, that he had taught with authority. He was unlike the rabbis and the religious uh, leaders of their own day who simply commented on the commentators. 
In the Old Testament, God commissioned his prophets to deliver his revelation. They were to serve as his mouthpiece or spokesman. That in itself is remarkable considering the sinfulness of the people, but even more spectacular, more amazing, more wonderful is the revelation of Christ Jesus, who is described as the word of God made flesh. In other words, he not only delivers the word of the Lord, he is the word of the Lord who dwells among his people. And as a prophet, praise be to God, Jesus came to proclaim the message of the kingdom. He proclaimed a message calling for faith and repentance. A message proclaimed to you and to me. A message that, that we must hear, but also respond to repent and believe. Keep repenting. Keep believing. Believers are not merely receivers of information or inspiration, but believers are called to respond to what that is that they have received. Information and inspiration is for transformation. The prophet speaks and we must listen. Maverick has to learn that. Maverick has to learn that Christ is the master. And as master, his words must direct Maverick's pathway, our pathway, together. Now by nature. By nature, we do not like to do what we're told to do. We see it in the toddler already. Mom and dad says, they learn the word no quick. Mom and dad says come and they say no. Or mom and dad says this and they say no. By nature, we resist the authority structures in our lives. But without the word of life, the word of light directing us, we would just wander through life aimless and pointless like so many. Why, is, why, is, why are there so many people living in, in, in the realm of depression? How many in our society have no lasting purpose? Oh no, how they then need the prophet who, who, who perfectly reveals to us, tells us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. If Christ had not come, we would be in the dark for eternity. Christ has revealed the gospel in him. The gospel light shines from him. We learn what it is to be a person of faith and what it is to live by faith, to be found faithful and full of faith, a, a life filled with the obedience of faith. Maverick has to learn that too. Jesus tells us if you want to understand who God is and what God has done and is doing and will yet and do, look to the Christ. Christ has come to tell us the way to enter the kingdom. And how is that way opened? Why? Secondly, by his work as a priest. Christ was sent by the Father to serve as our only high priest in order to set us free by the one sacrifice of his body. And who, even now, continually pleads our cause with the Father. In the Old Testament, the, the priests served a, a vital role in the lives of, of, of God's people. They established the, the crucial link between God and man, a link which had been severed by Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. The priests were responsible for the offering of sacrifices and the particular sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for the covenant people. And this was especially true with respect to the high priest on that day. On the day of the atonement, the priest would enter uh, behind the curtain and the curtain and enter the Holy of Holies, sprinkling blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, serving as a reminder to Israel that blood Blood must be shed for the atonement of God's people. Blood necessary in order to be accepted before the throne of the Father. And when that work was completed, that the priest would come back 
uh, to the people with, with, with God's benediction. Remember Zacharias, he, he couldn't speak. He was to give the benediction. He couldn't do it, but ordinarily the benediction would be then lifted upon the people of the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's a tremendous blessing, congregation, to receive the benediction of the Lord. And this priest then representing the interchange and the exchange between God and his people, the priest showing what was necessary to come before the Father in such a way that our sins, your sin, and my sin would not block such communion. The priest gave testimony of God's blessing to the people as a token of the freedom, the freedom that is ours in receiving payment for sin. In our scripture lesson from Matthew, it was of course mentioned to the prophets of old, but at 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus, as the mediator of the covenant of grace, became the once for all sacrifice. Sacrifice to save, as we read in the book of Hebrews, to save to the uttermost. And through the sacrifice, God's blessing rests on his people. And what a joy it is for the believer to confess, for Maverick to come to know, to confess that Christ has come to offer himself for the sins of his people, yours and mine. And through his offering to secure redemption, and furthermore, to confess that Christ's priestly work continues for he is at the right hand of the Father making intercession on behalf of his people. He, he pleads our cause before the Father. He, he prays for us. He, he blesses us with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then there's more. There's that third office, that of his kingship. Already at his birth, we sing of the newborn king. And in his ministry, not only did Jesus Christ proclaim the kingdom, not only did Christ secure the kingdom by his sacrificial death, we recognize that he is the king of the kingdom, Lord of lords. King of kings, he rules, he has dominion, he is busy gathering, defending, and preserving his church. He is the one who protects us from ourselves, and in faith we confess that he will put all enemies under his feet. The Christian rejoices to confess that the last enemy to be destroyed is death, and Christ has destroyed as king as priest and as prophet, that enemy. As king, he governs us by his word and spirit. He guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. He leads the way we follow. Christ has led the way through death, which we must all face, and through the grave. And his resurrection testifies to the triumph, testifies to our resurrection as King Christ Jesus says to us in, in all the shadows of life, and you know, congregation, some of those shadows, in all the difficulties of life, and we all have our share, in all the questions of life, in all the disappointments of life, Jesus the Christ says, follow me. I will carry your burdens. Follow me. I will lift up your burdens. When our lives focus on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, we can let go of the desire to be in control of our own lives and we can rest in the sure promise of God that he will lead the way step by step. Jesus says to us again this afternoon, listen to me, hear what I have to say, believe in my work, 
and you will be safe and secure. Now, of course, this does not mean that life will be a, a simple path, an easy street. In the potholes of life, in the roads of construction in our lives, Christ Jesus will lead the way by his word and spirit. He is commander in chief and his call, his bidding, his rule has been given to us for our comfort and joy. And these things must be so because those who have confessed Christ in truth have received a calling an anointing. Why are you called a Christian? What is it that demonstrates, defines, describes you? If, if someone to, were to ask you, as they asked Jesus in, in a certain measure, who do you say that you are? How ought you to respond? How do we with what do we identify? Now we ought never, first of all, identify ourselves by our church affiliation, nor by what we do from day to day or our ethnic background. Believers, praise be God, have received all of grace and identity. In this world, we live with those who suffer from an identity crisis. But that should not be of us. Christians have been anointed an appointment, an anointment and an appointment received in our baptism. And those who embrace Christ in faith, those who have received Christ and his benefits, then receive a profound, a deep calling as we seek to be pupils of Christ in the school of Christ, as followers of Christ. And our catechism unfolds that again in three ways. And again, we use the words prophet, priest, and king with the catechism students, I say PPK, and I expect them to say prophet, priest, and king. These are words that, that describe what the Christian is to look like. In Acts 11, we, we heard of the ministry of the apostles at Antioch and how they were busy teaching and preaching concerning Jesus Christ. It would have been, been a marvel to be in their midst to, to see how all of this was developing and unfolding for a full year they assembled with the church and they taught a great many people and then then we hear these words oh but blessed words and the disciples that is the followers of Christ Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch they were identifiable as a particular people. Now a Christian is a prophet. Not, in a, not a prophet in the sense that we are instruments of new revelation from God for the canon of God's word has been completed. But prophets in the sense that, that our task as a church to the watching world our, and our task as the Lord's people is to openly proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh yes, the work of social justice has a place. But the primary place of a church, a church that will stand because the church that does not preach Christ falls down. The primary purpose of the church and her believers is to tell the good news the gospel of Christ. Go tell on the mountains. Go tell in the valleys. Go tell the neighborhoods in Dunville the truth about Jesus. Tell of the, the reason of the hope that lies within us, the hope that does not disappoint. 
For we have been anointed to confess his name. We, we are to be more than hearers of the word. For prophets are also doers of the word. When God gives us an opportunity to bear witness to the word. We bear witness to Christ. We then exercise our prophetic role in speaking of Christ. How many people also in our own neighborhoods have no understanding of Christ. In Acts 26, we heard King Agrippa respond to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul had been testifying uh, that the message that he spoke was a message of life. It was a message that he, he proclaimed openly and not simply in, in a little dark corner. No, it was a message of, of the comfort and the power of Christ's resurrection glory. What a message we have to speak, to live. Now, the Christian is not only a prophet, but also a priest. We have... Uh, a wonderful description as to our identity, prophet, priest, believers desire to present themselves to Christ as a living sacrifice of thanks. Already in Exodus 19, God describes his people as a kingdom of priests whose lives are to be dedicated to the Lord's service. Our bodies are to be living sacrifices of service to Christ and his cause. Christ and his kingdom, Christ and his covenant, Christ and his crown. Uh, the principal cause of Christ rests in his church, and we must love the church, pray for the church, serve the church, and as priests, give ourselves to the life of the church. But by extension, Christ's kingdom includes service amongst the family. Christ's kingdom includes our work and how it is that we serve one another in Christ's name. One of the liberating principles of the Reformation was the restoration of, of the call of the, the priesthood of all believers. Not just a clergy, but the priesthood of all the believers. What a privilege. What a privilege to seek then the lonely, the afflicted, those who sorrow, those who struggle, a priesthood that sacrifices. It's a lofty calling, a calling that needs to be answered, a calling that will even call us to partake of Christ's sufferings. We do not know what the Lord has in store, but more and more we are aware of the opposition that is being trumpeted in our society against the Christian faith. A certain bill in the, in the parliament, is it C-69, Bruce, or C-63? One of those two. And uh, it's a bill that would seek to silence the Christian telling the truth. Certain people would argue that uh, reading the Ten Commandments is hate speech. We have to know that our calling as priests will also come with a measure of suffering. Our witness is mocked. Our call to uphold the commands of God is ridiculed. The lifestyle that the Bible calls us to live, as families and marriage and so forth, it's laughed at. What does the Bible tell us? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And to remember that God will give us the strength that we need. We need not fear. He'll give us the word we need to speak. He'll put it in our heart and on our lip. And then also that strength to be a king. 
The king is to strive, that is to exercise some, some measure of effort, some spiritual sweat. To strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life. Through Christ, we are nobility. Maverick belongs to nobility. The king has princes and princesses. You and I, we have a regal calling and task. We have marching orders. We represent the king as his ambassadors, as his soldiers. And it is our calling to uphold his authority. Kingdom rule must be promoted. Kingdom rule in all areas of life, politics, agriculture, reformed Christian education, business and commerce and so forth. Because Christ Jesus as king reigns, he's ruling, we can be sure the victory is ours. And the promise of the gospel is that, that Christians are those who will one day reign with Christ. Think, think about it. To reign and rule with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Now, now that's breathtaking, isn't it? In this world of preparation, we, we may already be setting our sights on, on the tasks that will be given to us in the kingdom to come. And what a glory, what a glory is ours. To be a prophet, a priest, and a king is more than a hollow slogan. It is a, a act of calling. It's a calling that Maverick will have to come to embrace. And it's a calling that can be answered, for it is a calling that rests in Christ, our chief prophet and teacher, our only high priest, and our eternal king. It's a calling that is upheld in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, a calling to be lived. And may our prayers be that we receive much grace to rejoice in the person of the Christ and to be found faithful to his call. Amen. Let us uh, speak our amen through the singing of the four opening stanzas, verses of Psalm 105.
Well, in worship, it's our privilege not only to rest in the Word of God proclaimed, but also to together celebrate the sacraments. I'm mindful of question and answer 66, where the sacraments are described as holy visible signs and seals instituted by God, so by their use, he, the Lord God, might more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And then comes one of my favorite lines in the entire catechism, and this is the promise that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Let us uh, then turn to a word of instruction in the back of the book of Prage. It's page 597. We our witness to these words many times. One of the brothers said to me in the consistory room, you know, we've had a lot of baptisms. And I think that's great. To hear again what is signified, what is sealed in in the doctrine of baptism is, is a rich treasure that we have. And so we should not hear these words lightly as though we've heard them before. No, they must be new to us over and again. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of holy baptism is summarized as follow. First, we and our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore by nature children of wrath so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. This is what the immersion in or sprinkling with water teaches us. It signifies the impurity of our souls so that we may detest ourselves and humble ourselves before God and seek our cleansing and salvation outside of ourselves. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. We are therefore baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized in the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that he establishes an eternal covenant of grace with us. He adopts us for his children and heirs and promises to provide us with all good and avert all evil, or turn it to our benefits. When we are baptized in the name of the Son, God the Son promises us that he washes us in his blood from all our sins and unites us with him in his death and resurrection. Thus we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this sacrament that he will dwell in us and make us living members of Christ, imparting to us what we have in Christ, namely the cleansing from our sins and the daily renewal of our lives till we shall finally be presented without blemish among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. Third, since every covenant contains two parts, a promise and an obligation, we are, through baptism, called and obliged by the Lord to new obedience. We are to cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to trust him and to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and with all our strength. We must not love the world, but put off our old nature and lead a God-fearing life. 
And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sins, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin. For baptism is a seal and trustworthy testimony that we have an eternal covenant with God. Although our children do not understand all this, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism just as they share without their knowledge in the condemnation of Adam, so are they without their knowledge received into grace in Christ. For the Lord spoke to Abraham, the father of all believers, and thus also speaks to us and our children, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Peter also testifies to this when he says, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Therefore, in the old dispensation, God commanded that infants be circumcised, this circumcision was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. Christ also took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. In the new dispensation, baptism has replaced circumcision. Therefore, infants must be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant. And as they grow up, their parents have the duty to instruct them in these things. Beloved, in order that we may now administer this holy sacrament of God to his glory for our comfort and to the upbuilding of the congregation, let us call upon the Lord's holy name. <clears throat> Almighty, eternal God, in thy righteous judgment, thou hast punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood, but in thy great mercy saved and protected the believer Noah and his family. Thou hast drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, but led thy people Israel through the midst of the sea on dry ground, by which baptism was signified. And so, Father, we pray that in thy infinite mercy thou wilt graciously look upon this little child here, Maverick, and incorporate him by thy Holy Spirit into thy Son, Jesus Christ, so that Maverick may be buried with him by baptism into death and raised with him, raised with our Lord, to walk in newness of life. And we pray, Lord, that Maverick, following Jesus Christ day by day, that he may learn to follow, that he may then also joyfully bear his cross and know what it is to cleave to Jesus the Christ in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Grant that Maverick, comforted in thee, may leave this life one day which is no more than a constant death and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ, thy Son. All this we ask through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who with thee and the Holy Spirit, one and only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. This time we would ask uh, Sid and Delena to rise. Beloved in the Lord, once again you've heard that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord, the Lord our God, to seal to us and to our children, to the children the Lord, to little Maverick as he's been given to you, the children of his covenant, 
We must therefore use the sacrament for that purpose and not out of custom or superstition. That it may be clear then that you desire baptism for the right purpose. You are to answer sincerely the following questions. In the first place, do you confess that our children, also then Maverick, though conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation, are sanctified in Christ and thus as members of his church ought to be baptized. Second, do you confess the doctrine, the teaching of the Old and New Testament summarized in the confessions taught here in this Christian church is the true and complete doctrine of salvation. Third, do you promise as father and mother to instruct Maverick in this doctrine as soon as he's able to understand and to have him instructed therein to the utmost of your power. Brother Sid Alkama, what is your answer? Uh, Sister Delaney Alkama, what is your answer? Well, bring him forth. Maverick, Alkama, I baptize you into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, it is our great privilege to witness the waters of baptism. We are so thankful to the Lord that he calls each of us beginning at a tender age to himself. And let us rejoice together as we sing hymn 56.
brother and sister, may the Lord give you every grace needed from above to lead this little one in the ways of the Lord as a prophet and a priest and a king, looking to Jesus, who is our prophet, priest, and king. Strength from above with his blessing. In life, we cannot go forward without prayer. Prayer is one of the great gifts the Lord gives to us, and even as we have witnessed these waters of baptism, we offer the Lord, to the Lord, a a prayer of thanksgiving. So let's join our hearts together as one and pray to the Lord. Almighty and merciful God and Father, we thank and praise Thee that Thou hast forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We could celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning. And now the sacrament of holy baptism this afternoon and confess the great promise of the gospel. Thou hast received us through thy Holy Spirit as members of thine only begotten Son and so adopted us to be thy children. And thou hast sealed and confirmed this to us by holy baptism. And we pray, Lord, that by thy beloved Son, Jesus the Christ, that thou wilt always govern little maverick by thy Holy Spirit, that he may be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness, and that he may grow and increase in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that maverick may thus acknowledge thy fatherly goodness and mercy which thou hast shown to him and to all of us here. And we pray, Father, that that he may live under that banner of grace and all righteousness, under our only teacher, king, and high priest, Jesus Christ, and valiantly fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and all his whole dominion. May Maverick, too, join that great chorus of praise, praising and magnifying thee and thy Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one and only true God. So as we go... Our separate ways soon as we go into the week that is before us, we may not know what each day may bring, but help us to go forth in confidence. We place our hands in thine, fully aware that it is thy hand in ours to lead us through the pathways of life, be it joy or sorrow, pleasure or pain, success or failure. Give us, we we pray earnestly, a desire to love what thou lovest and a will to love thy holy will. Help us to be God-pleasers, to know what it is, to test the spirits of our age, to let go of empty words, to keep our vows and never to call evil good. Father in heaven, we pray. Help us to live out of the light of thy word, out of our good confession of faith and Lord, be near to us as a congregation. Thou knowest us better than we ourselves. Thou knowest every little corner of our hearts. We pray, Lord, grant us in earnest, we pray, a a living confidence, a boldness to, to step forward, knowing that we live under the rule of Christ as a a, a privilege of his priestly work, that we live knowing that his word, his promise to us is sure. Thou art the covenant God, and we rejoice in thy promises. We pray, Lord, for those with special needs in terms of a struggle of faith, and we pray, Lord, answer those needs. 
Bless the children as they soon return to school. And as we've prayed earlier, help us to understand that what may happen in, in the skies tomorrow are only a small testimony of what is yet to come. O oh Lord, thou art great and greatly to be praised. And we thank thee for all thy glory. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The deacons will come forth now to receive of what the Lord has first given you. The offerings for the ministry of word and deed. And then in doxology, we will conclude with the singing of Psalm 52, 5 and 6.
And now, beloved congregation, as we go forth, as we go forth to proclaim the goodness of the name of the Lord, go forth with the blessing, the benediction of our God. Lift up your hearts and to heaven and now receive his word of blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.